Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India As you know, screening for TAAs or tumor associated autoantibodies is a novel concept where the aim is to detect the autoantibodies or antibodies produced in the body much ahead of time. And they have lot of clinical utility especially for the early detection of cancer and other diseases. In today's lecture, MS Nikita will discuss about a few more applications of protein microarrays using different case studies to provide you a broad understanding of potential of protein microarray based technology. You must understand and appreciate that there are many applications which are possible on different type of protein microarray based technology platforms. This lecture will also provide you understanding for novel applications for doing various protein interaction studies, post translation modification, kinase substrate screening etc. using high throughput microarray based platforms. So, let us welcome Nikita for today's lecture. A very good morning to all of you. In the previous lecture, you have seen how protein microarray can be used to detect the presence of autoantibodies in the biofluids of cancer patients. In this lecture, we will further look into the applications of protein microarrays that can be used to understand the signaling network and to understand the time bound post translational modification happening at the cellular level. Protein protein interaction occurs when two or more proteins interact with each other to carry out a biological function. These interactions mediate several cellular processes and understanding these interactions would help in understanding the function of proteins and to identify the disease pathobiology. So, once we dissect these interactions, we can end up finding few druggable targets and new therapeutic approaches that can be used to treat the disease. Traditional approaches like yeast to hybrid system, tandem affinity chromatography, etc. have provided invaluable insight into the protein-protein interaction. However, these techniques just look at one or two proteins, study these proteins in isolation and sometimes even end up giving false positive results. These networks, the signaling pathways are dynamic, therefore studying a protein in isolation might not provide a fuller picture of the interacting pathway. Therefore, high throughput platforms like protein microarrays can hold immense value to screen multiple proteins together and hence can be used to decipher the protein-protein interactions. So, let us start with one of the case studies where Chan et al have used protein microarrays to understand the pathway of T lymphocytes upon activation with CD3 and CD28 antibodies. Chan et al have made multiplex reverse phase protein microarray and these protein microarrays were used to study the pathways in T cells which were activated upon a stimulation with CD3 and CD28 molecules. In this current study, they monitored the site specific phosphorylation of numerous signaling molecules and they performed uh, a time bound experiment to look into the pathways that are activated upon stimulation with the cell receptors. So, to check whether this reverse phase protein microarray is working, they first took the Zurka T cell lines and activated it with PMA. PMA is forbol 12 myrosate acetate. This PMA activates protein kinase C. This protein kinase C once activated leads to phosphorylation of MAPK and MEK proteins and hence the phosphorylation was studied. The cell isates were taken and imprinted in triplicates for the untreated as well as PMA treated cell lines. The phosphorylation of these proteins were studied using phosphoantibodies. In this diagram you can see that MAP case showed a very good phosphorylation upon PMA treatment whereas the untreated cells did not show any phosphorylation. MEK also showed a differential phosphorylation upon PMA treatment. 
whereas AKT which is not a target of protein kinase C showed no change in the phosphorylation levels. SLP76 and beta actin were used as control and no changes were seen in the treated as well as the untreated cells. The same was verified using western blot which is shown in this image. Once they were sure that this experiment is working, they have taken the T Zurkut cell lines and they have treated it with CD3 antibody, CD28 antibody or CD3 and CD28 antibody in combination. The cell lines were stimulated over the period of 30 minutes and the cell lysates were imprinted at 6 different time points. The time points were 0 minutes, 2.5 minutes, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes and 30 minutes. These cell lysates were then probed with phosphoantibodies to look for the phosphorylation status. Further, these slides were incubated with HRP conjugated secondary antibodies. Tyramide amplification was further performed in which HRP catalyzes accumulation of biotinylated tyramide. This biotinylated tyramide was further detected using streptavidine which was labeled with Psi3. Simultaneously, these arrays were also probed with Psi5 linked antibodies to detect the level of actin in the cell lysates. Here in the array picture you can see the red spot shows the actin level whereas the green spots show the phosphorylation status of the cells. This is one of the subarray where the phosphorylation of MAPK was studied. The cells were treated with isotype antibodies which acted as control. The cells were treated with CD3 antibody, CD28 antibody and CD3 and CD28 antibody in combination. Here you can see that when the cells were treated with CD3, there was a quick phosphorylation observed at 2.5 minutes which reduced at 5 minutes. But there was no change in the phosphorylation status of MAPK when the cells were treated with CD28 antibodies. When the cells were treated with the combination of CD3 and CD28, a sustained phosphorylated MAPK was observed and the signal intensity even at 5 minutes was prominent. Further, to study the signal transduction kinetics, uh, the authors studied the phosphorylation level of phospholipase C gamma protein. In this again the cell lines were treated at different time points and cells were treated with isotype antibodies as control with CD3 antibody, CD28 antibody and a combination of CD3 and CD28 antibodies. Also the protein microarray was probed with non-phospho antibodies to study the overall concentration of phospholipase C in the cell lysate. The graph shown here shows the adjusted level of phosphorylated PLC gamma with the total phospholipase C present in the cell. So in this graph you can see the phosphorylation kinetics did not change when the cells were treated with isotype control antibodies. However, when the cells were treated with anti-CD3 antibodies, a quick phosphorylation was seen at around 2.5 minutes which then dropped at 10 minutes and reached the baseline level. The green line shows the phosphorylation level of PLC upon treatment with CD28. Here you can see that although the phosphorylation was less but then it was sustained till 30 minutes. When the cell lines were treated with both CD3 and CD28 antibodies, a quick increase in the phosphorylation status of PLC was seen at 2.5 minutes similar to CD3. However, this phosphorylation sustained and reached the level which was similar to the level that was obtained upon activation with CD28. To further delineate the signaling pathways, a cell line that is J gamma 1 which is a mutant cell line of Zurka T cells which do not have the phospholipase C was used and wild type T Zorkut cells were seen to study the phosphorylation kinetics of the downstream signaling components. In this case, J gamma 1 cell lines and the wild type cell lines were treated with CD3 and CD28 antibody in combination. Different time points were studied. In the first graph, you can see that the levels of phospho PLC showed an increased uh, phosphorylation at around 5 minutes, uh, which gradually decreased. However, there was no change in phosphorylation status seen in the J gamma 1 cell lines, confirming that these cell lines are deficient in PLC. Further, the phosphorylation status of MAPK and MEK were studied and here we can see that in the wild type cell lines, the phosphorylation of MAPK and MEK 
sustained over 30 minutes. However, in case of mutant cell lines, the phosphorylation dropped drastically upon 20 minutes, stating that phosphorylation status of MAP, K and MEC is dependent on the presence of phospholipase C gamma protein. Whereas when the phosphorylation status of AKT was seen, no change in the phosphorylation status was seen in the wild type as well as in the mutant cell lines. This infers that the presence of phospholipase C does not affect the phosphorylation kinetics of AKT protein. To further understand the signaling events in the T cells, Chan et al. activated T Zorkat cell lines with CD3 antibody and with CD3 and CD28 antibody in combination. These cell lysates uh, were stimulated for 2.5 minutes and were imprinted in 6 replicates onto the nitrocellulose membrane coated slides. Further, the phosphorylation status for these 62 proteins were studied using phosphoantibodies. Upon activation with CD3, 13 proteins showed a substantial change in phosphorylation. When the cells were stimulated using CD3 and CD28, 14 proteins showed change in phosphorylation of which most of these proteins showed an overlap. In this study, they identify that the RAF1 protein showed dephosphorylation upon stimulation with the antibodies. Further, to study the phosphorylation kinetics of RAF protein and its downstream signaling pathway, the cells were stimulated using different combinations of antibodies. Upon 2.5 minutes, steep dephosphorylation of RAF protein was seen in cell lines treated with CD3 antibody and CD3 antibody in combination with CD28 antibodies. There was no change seen in the phosphorylation level of RAF protein when the cells were treated with CD28 antibody. Further, they studied the phosphorylation patterns of MEC and MAPK proteins. This phosphorylation pattern matched well with the dephosphorylation patterns of RAF protein and as the RAF protein dephosphorylated, increased phosphorylation of MEC and MAPK was seen at 2.5 minutes which substantially degraded over the period of 30 minutes in the cells treated with CD3 antibodies and the cells treated with CD3 and CD28 antibodies in combination. This dephosphorylation of RAF was further cross-checked using western blot. To conclude, Chan et al. studied time dependent phosphorylation kinetics of several downstream signaling molecules in a time dependent manner. They concluded that PLC gamma 1 is not essential for the ERK kinase pathway as there was no change seen in the phosphorylation of AKT in the cells that were deficient in phospholipase C protein. Also they screened the phosphorylation level of 62 downstream signaling proteins and identified a novel instance where RAF1 showed dephosphorylation upon T cell receptor stimulation. Now going ahead to the another study where Ro et al prepared an acetylome peptide microarray to screen the activity of 7 different isoforms of sirtuins against 6800 unique mammalian acetylation sites. Sirtuins are the enzymes which deacetylate the lysine residues in the presence of NAD. In this study, database search was performed to look for all the conserved acetylation sites in the mammalian system. A total of 6802 peptides in its acetylated and non-acetylated forms were imprinted. The peptides that were used here had lysine at the 7th position which was flanked by 6 amino acids at the upstream as well as at the downstream. So therefore, a 13 mer peptides were imprinted onto the arrays and the total of 13,000 604 peptides were immobilized in triplicates. This peptide arrays were further incubated with different isoforms of sirtuins and without sirtuins and they were also incubated with and without NAD to check for the activity of sirtuins. These peptide arrays were further probed with primary and secondary antibody to look for the change in the level of acetylation upon incubation with sirtuins. The decrease in the signal intensity of acetylation was further calculated using Welch t-test. These acetylation patterns were also validated using mass spectrometry and this study resulted in identification of substrate preferences for different sirtuins isoforms. Further, this study ended up in identification of new targets for sirtuins. So, first in this study, 
what they have done is they have printed an array SA represents subarray. These subarrays were treated with buffer control where no certwins were used. These arrays were also treated with certwins with and without NAD. Since certwins need NAD for their activity, there shall be no deacetylation seen when there is no NAD present. Here you can see that there was no change in signal in buffer control as well as when the array was treated with certwins without NAD. Whereas a loss in signal intensity was seen when the arrays were treated with certwin in presence of NAD. Concluding that uh, certwins need NAD for deacetylation and also confirming that deacetylation is happening on the array. This graph represents the specific activity of certwin 3, how the deacetylation is happening for different peptides. The last protein that is AATAS K was used as a negative control and has shown no change in the acetylation pattern. This heat map shows the deacetylation activity of all the 7 isoforms of sertwins across 6800 peptides. Sertwin 1, 6 and 7 locates at the nucleus. However, when you look at the target peptides, there is a specific pattern of preference of these peptides for sertwin 6, 7 and 1. If you look properly at sertwin 6 and sertwin 7, a specific deacetylation pattern is seen which signifies that these two isoform has their specific targets whereas sertwin 1 shows a nominal activity across a wide range of substrate in the nucleus. This logo here shows the peptide that were used. The upper panel of the logo that is the enriched section shows the preferred amino acids for each sertwin whereas the lower bottom shows depleted amino acid sequence that is the sequence that do not favor the deacetylation. Also, the right panel shows the peptide binding groups of these sertwin molecules whereas the blue region signifies the positively charged amino acids and the red region shows the negatively charged amino acids. The peptide preference for sertwin 1 is majorly positively charged amino acids that is arginine or lysines as the core has negative charge. Therefore, sertwin 1 prefers the peptides that have positive charge specifically at position minus 5, minus 1, 1 and 4 whereas the peptide binding group of sertwin 6 is majorly hydrophobic and hence the peptide sequence that are specific to sertwin 6 majorly have hydrophobic residue specifically at minus 1, minus 2, plus 3 and plus 4 sites. However, at plus 2 and minus 4 there is a negatively charged residue. Coming to the other isoforms of sertwins that is 3, 4 and 5 which locates at the mitochondria. Here also you can see that there is a huge change in the preferences of the peptides that are selected by all the three different isoforms. In this you can see that the peptide binding groove for sertwin 3 is highly negative. Owing to that the peptides that are preferred by sertwin 3 had a lot of positively charged residue specifically arginine at the upstream of the acetylated lysine. For cert 5 you can see that at position 1 proline was predominantly present. The other upstream amino acids were either positively charged or nonpolar whereas the downstream amino acids were majorly positively charged. Coming to the another cert 1 that is cert 2 which is majorly found in the cytosolic region of the cell you can see that the peptide binding groove for cert 2 is highly negative and therefore it disfavors the presence of negatively charged amino acids in the sequence preference. Except for sertwin 4, all other sertwins have some or the other targets for deacetylation. However, there was no identified substrate for sertwin 4. In the fluorescence assay, sertwin 4 showed a low but consistent deacetylation activity upon incubation with NAD. From this study, NADP transhydrogenase stress 70 protein was found to be one of the substrate specific for sertwin 4. To confirm this deacetylation activity of sertwin 4, the deacetylation of NADP transhydrogenase stress 70 protein was performed using wild type sertwin without NAD, wild type sertwin with NAD and a mutant sertwin which did not have the deacetylase activity. When the substrate was incubated with wild type sertwin 4 and with NAD, a strong deacetylation activity was seen confirming that 
NADP transhydrogenase stress 70 protein is a substrate for sertwin 4 To conclude, this study has used microarray platform to parallelly screen around 6000 peptides for 7 different isoforms of sertwin. Using this platform, the authors were able to identify the sequence of specificity for different isoforms of sertwins. They also identified a substrate for sertwin 4 which is NADP transhydrogenase stress 70 protein. Further, they confirm that malate dehydrogenase protein is one of the target of sertwin 3 and peroxyredoxin 1, peroxyredoxin 3 and mitochondrial protein HSP60 are targets for sertwin 5. This peptide microarray platform concluded that all these different 7 isoforms of human sertwins have a sequence of specificity and preferred substrate for deacetylation. To conclude, protein microarrays holds immense potential in identifying new targets, in delineating the pathway and hence providing a deeper insight into the signaling kinetics at cellular level. Thank you. I hope by now you understood that there are wide applications of protein microarray could be achieved especially from different type of protein microarray based technology platforms in the areas of detection for novel protein interactions, post transition modification in high throughput manner. These examples would have also provided you an insight into the utility of protein microarray based technologies for screening several proteins in parallel providing a holistic understanding of the post transition modification and signaling networks. In the next lecture, we will talk about how to make arrays and print your own chip using novel printing technologies. So, I will see you next lecture and we will talk to you about the latest advancement in this area and how you can make your own arrays and recent developments in the areas of printing technologies. Thank you.